Yes, uh, President Obama did have an opportunity to telephone uh, President Putin today. Uh, that call was uh, placed at President Putin's request, uh, and it was a call to discuss the ongoing conversations about uh, arriving at an understanding around a cessation of hostilities uh, in Syria. There remain still the two least meaningful words in the military lexicon, cease fire, mostly because every time it's used, it means close to zero. For example, almost 10 days ago, Secretary of State John Kerry made a proud announcement about a provisional ceasefire in Syria and that it would take about a week to stop the bullets and bombs from flying. Yet here we are past the deadline. And Sunday alone, it's estimated 200 people were killed in continuing attacks. And let's load on top of this how Secretary Kerry and Russian officials just this day set a new date of this coming Saturday for a ceasefire to begin. Cease fire, the words with truly little or no meat behind them in this administration. Many others as well. All right, let's put some meat behind the issue. Welcome back. The senior political scientist at the RAND Corporation, Richard Brennan, joins us. Richard, always Thanks. a pleasure to get a chance to talk to you here. And those two words, cease fire. It's a plan for a ceasefire starting on Saturday that it would exclude attacks on the Islamic State group and al-Qaeda's local affiliate. Two questions here. First of all, why are we supposed to believe that this ceasefire will work when basically it's, it's a temporary truce? And why are we not going after the bad guys? <laughs> well, you, you know, the, the big issue when we're, we're looking at this, this ceasefire is that if it's successful, it would mean that the Russians and the, and the Syrian government feel that they're in a very strong position for negotiating the, the continuation of the Assad regime. Uh, you know, we, look, we look at peace as being free, but peace always had, has costs. And so what you're seeing with these ceasefires is a series of of negotiations that uh, are, are likely to fall through that are giving different parties tactical advantage so they, they can position themselves for the ultimate victory that they want to achieve. I think this is just the next step and there's no reason that we would anticipate that this is going to be any more successful than the previous ones have been. Which then comes to my second question. Please expand on this if you will. This is supposedly designed to bring everybody back to the negotiating table or to a negotiating table in Geneva. Honest to goodness, why are we supposed to believe that this one will succeed anywhere that any other ceasefire has in the past? It hasn't worked. What, what makes us believe this one will? Well, the, and you, you've hit the, the crux of the problem. The fact is that the Syrian government and the, Rus and the Russians and the Iranians have completely opposite goals and objectives in the United States. So going to the table to discuss uh, the, what were the terms of a settlement where the U.S. government is saying that we want a new government, we want a representative government, that's never going to happen given, given the support of the, of the Russians and the, and the Iranians. And so unless this, this war is won on the battlefield, which it looks like the Russians are moving towards the ability to do against the opposition forces, it's not likely that we're going to see any type of real nego negotiated settlement that would result in the type of peace that the United States and our allies in the region think would be uh, successful or would, would be necessary for our long-term security. Two minutes, two final things here. China is now selling more and more weapons to the rest of the world. Now, granted, the U.S., Russia, and Britain, our arms export also increased. But what are we to take and how dangerous is it to see that China's export is, is increasing exponentially? It, it's just an, another indication that China is looking at itself as a global power and that it's going to want to exert itself as a global power. And one way of doing that is selling arms and munitions to, to allies and, and partners around the world. And Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Myanmar are the three countries that are basically getting the bulk of the weapons here. And I will tell you this, even people who are neophytes when it comes to foreign policy, they hear about Pakistan getting more arms, and they immediately start to shake just a little bit. All right, 60 seconds, here we go. U.S. Special Forces are in Central America going after street gangs trying to prevent the violence that causes illegal immigration into the United States. Richard, do the experts see this as a smart move? You know, we have to look very carefully. I, I haven't seen that report yet, but, but special forces have, have a very limited role in what they can do in, in the support of law enforcement. And so uh, what I suspect they're involved in, more likely with is drug-related drug issues for that, that, they've been, that they've been doing for the last you know, 20, 30 years. I guess what's happening here is, too, a lot of this is going on in Honduras, where they're aiding a local SWAT team here. They're trying to stay in the background. We've, we've heard a lot of this before, and I know this makes people very nervous that we're getting involved in something like this again. Are we perhaps just 
expanding ourselves again a little too thin. Well, you know, one of the things that we've done in Central America, frankly, is we've abandoned it. After the what was apparently a victory in the at the end of the Reagan administration and the walk and the uh, the Sandinistas leaving power, the United States essentially removed all of all of its influence, many of its tools, and so we're just now getting reengaged in that region. And I think that at a certain point in time, we need to recognize that Central America and Mexico are are our neighbors forever. And we just can't walk away like we've done in the past. And we need consistent long-term engagement to include the, the, the use of special forces where it's appropriate and, and useful. This particular issue, I, I think we just need to look closely at. Look closely indeed and make sure we're not making mistakes. Richard Brennan, thanks so much for joining us. We'll speak to you again real soon. Stay with us, everybody. The fastest 60 minutes of news, the hard line continues.